everyone, and welcome to my complete Arch-Tempered Valhazak guide. I'm going to split this guide into three parts. Basic tips, advanced tips, and finally Arch-Tempered Valhazak's top five strongest moves. So kind of like a move set breakdown. Let's jump right into the basic tips. Number one, take three levels of effluvial resistance. Those are miasma decorations. Most of you probably already know this one. There's no need to test whether you should try taking only one level of effluvial resistance or two levels of effluvial resistance because lucky for you, I've already done this. I've already tested it pretty exhaustively. It does work out if you think you can fight him without taking a single hit from any of his moveset. And that's because even with two levels of effluvia resist, you're going to get afflicted by the status eventually, and then you're going to be in an easy one hit KO range for just about all of his moves. And you'll have to stop and eat a null berry and heal up. It's more convenient to just go ahead and take the third level of effluvial resist, okay? If you haven't played the game long enough to unlock three miasma decorations, first of all, you're probably not ready for this fight. Secondly, your other option for building effluvial resistance is to either wear the Valhazak beta lakes or build the miasma charm. So you do have options, it's just that you really haven't played the game very much if you don't have three miasma decorations. Just something to think about. Basic tip number two, you must augment your weapons for health regeneration. If you go into the fight without health regeneration, you will spend most of your time trying to heal up from Arch Tempered Valhazak's heavy DOT damage. DOT means damage over time. It doesn't matter what you're trying to do to cancel out his cloudy effluvia, whether you kite him away from it, or you try to use torch pods, or try to end his effluvia aura with Elder Seal, none of that is going to work in the long term for this fight. So you're gonna take a ton of DOT damage in this fight. The number one solution to countering Valhazak's heavy DOT damage is to bring a high damage weapon with a health regen augmentation. In fact, if you can afford to do two of those health regen augmentations, that would be even better. After you've brought your health regeneration weapon into the fight against Arch-Tempered Valhazak, you then need to do enough damage that you're regenerating your health faster then his DOT, his effluvia, can eat away at it. So you're basically recovering faster than you're dying. This is the key to making the fight easy, not just fast, but actually easy. So when you think of Arch-Tempered Valhazak, you need to think a high damage weapon mixed with the lifesteal, mixed with health regeneration. Basic tip number three, what are Arch-Tempered Valhazak's weaknesses? You're gonna focus all of your attacks on Valhazak's chest, head, and arms. If you're using a ranged weapon or a blade weapon, you can also focus on his tail, but blunt weapons like hammers and the hunting horn will pretty much want to ignore the tail, which is fine by the way, and for the most part you'll ignore his wings as well. They, they usually won't get in the way unless he falls over. If he falls over, try to stay away from them. Aim for his head. Breaking Valhazak's arms almost always leads to a knockdown, so don't feel bad if you're having trouble reaching his head consistently, just focus on each arm and you'll get two knockdowns anyways, and when he's knocked over, then you can easily, you know, focus on his head. Valhazak's tail can also be cut, and he even has an extra part on his back that can be broken as well. Well, you can kind of think of it as like part of his tummy, I guess, I'm not sure, but visually it shows a part of his back get broken. It's the area just above his hind legs. Basic tip number four, Arch-Tempered Valhazak is weakest to fire damage for elemental types. That's because even though it states he has a three-star weakness to dragon damage, he will only take dragon damage on the parts of his body that you've broken, and that takes a while, right? In other words, you won't be dealing any dragon damage for the first half of the fight, and if you're using a weapon that depends on elemental damage, that's really bad. Now that doesn't mean you shouldn't consider dragon damage. The Elder Seal can help by canceling his Effluvia Aura, but if you're going to use a weapon that relies on elemental damage output, for example like the bow, then you're going to choose a fire weapon. Whereas if you have a weapon that will mostly be dealing raw damage, a great example of this is the Devil Joe weapons, it's okay to then choose a dragon weapon for Elder Seal, right? Uh, and, and specifically, I use the Devil Joe Lance when I'm fighting Arch-Tempered Valhazak. It's one of those weapons you're, you're mostly going to be dealing raw but you do deal Elder Seal, and this will occasionally cause his effluvia to be disrupted. As for ailments, I wouldn't think too much about them. He's pretty resistant to all of the ailments. Uh, besides that, he has so much health that two or three procs of paralysis aren't really gonna make up for all the damage you lost, 
by not optimizing with a high raw or high fire damage weapon. Alright, and last basic tip is pretty universally true for all of the Arch-Tempered Monsters, and that's to simply fight him solo. It sounds odd, but Monster Hunter World is one of those few games where I've played cooperative and found that it's actually easier to go back and play the game by yourself <laughs> and not invite anyone to play with you. The reason for this is because you're always, always going to bring the Fortitude skill, uh, and this means no matter what you're doing, whether you're playing solo or multiplayer, Except when you are playing solo, what happens is you're allowed to die twice. You get all of the lives, they're no longer shared, right? And this is going to cause Fortitude to proc at least two times, and Fortitude is going to make you extremely tanky after two procs. Also, it gives you a large damage boost, and, and that's going to help you in the fight faster, as well as giving you more lifesteal, right? Because you're dealing more damage, you get more lifesteal from your health regen. So when you go solo, no more losing your lives to a random player who's still learning the fight. And if you happen to die, which you probably will, you're going to come back stronger again and again. And this just makes soloing monsters considerably easier than playing the multiplayers. It's unfortunate, but it's true. You also get to bring your unkillable palico with you. And for this fight, I recommend the Vigor Wasp Spray for a little extra healing. Actually, it's a lot of extra healing. I, I really do enjoy Vigor Wasp Spray for this game, or for this particular monster. Those are your five basic tips for fighting Arch-Tempered Valhazak, a Fluvial Resist 3, High Damage and Lifesteal, Pound Valhazak in the arms and the chest until they break, bring fire damage for elemental weapons, otherwise go raw or go raw mixed with Elder Seal, and finally, solo him and bring the Fortitude skill. Okay, and now we're going to talk about the more advanced tips. This is where I get a lot more specific about key details in the fight that you might not think about if you weren't already kind of experienced with fighting him. Keep in mind, some of the best tips are about how to handle his moveset, but those are going to be talked about in the third and the last part of the video, right? Advanced tip number one, Arch-Tempered Valhazak's new aura makes it much harder to use ranged weapons against him because they aren't going to do any damage while the aura is up unless you hit his head or the tip of his tail. It's not like you can't still use the bow effectively, but you're going to need a lot more practice in order to aim your shots on his pretty fast moving head, and his tail was always hard to land shots on, and it still is, uh, unless he's knocked over or in the middle of a long animation, right? Probably the easiest and cheesiest ranged strategy is going to be taking the Dark Devourer, or maybe the Magda Gometis, where you'll just spam cluster bombs and sticky ammo. Cluster bombs and sticky ammo are going to ignore his aura and his hit zones to deal the same high damage no matter where you land your shots. Just keep in mind, cluster bombs are not a, an ideal uh, bullet to spam when you're playing multiplayer, right? Because you'll knock everyone away. So this is really a, a play style for solo play. Unfortunately for light bow guns, uh, th these aren't very effective against him in my opinion, just because he has that new aura, and the aura is actually really effective at stopping fire ammo, which is what you would probably use. See, if he didn't have that aura, these would probably actually be pretty strong, but yeah, it it'll hit his head, try to hit his chest or something, but it it'll, it'll be blocked or something. It just doesn't seem to travel through his body very consistently, not in my opinion. Uh, and then you have the bow. The bow, as I said, it, it just takes more skill. Uh, also, the fact that it doesn't give you as much health regen augmentation. I could be wrong about that, but it really doesn't feel like it, it heals you by, by very much. So I would say that makes it harder as well. There's You can't go wrong with the cluster bomb spam. It's very hard to compare any other ranged weapon to it because it's just so damn powerful. Advanced tip number two. You're only going to be given one flash pod to use against Arch-Tempered Valhazak. After you use it, he actually recovers very quickly, and then he becomes completely immune to flash pods. So after playing against him for a while, I'm actually going to recommend, uh, from experience, that you should save your one flash pod as, uh, and use it as an interrupt for when he's trying to sneak off to his nest. One of the changes to Arch-Tempered Valhazak is that he no longer starts the fight in section 14 of the map, and that was a big reason that fighting regular Valhazak was so easy, because you would begin the fight and you'd immediately drop the two teeth hanging from the ceiling and these would give you big damage and two knockdowns. Well, if you save your one flash pod for when he's limping through section 14 to get to his nest, you can interrupt him before he gets away and then proceed to drop those teeth on him. 
I've heard people talk about starting the fight off with the challenger mantle and then kind of aggroing him and tricking him into going all the way down to section 14 just to drop those teeth but it takes it must take so much time to do that i can't imagine that being a very efficient method i think this using your one flash pod to, to stagger him while he's in the area and then luring him over and dropping the teeth that's going to be a lot more efficient you're just going to end your fights much faster advanced tip number three the turf war against Odogarin is an easy way to land a lot of damage on Valhazak. Just be sure that you don't accidentally aim for his head when he goes into this turf war, because he'll actually rear up during the fighting animation, and for most of the weapons, he's just going to be out of range, his head will. So it's better to start your attack combination on his weak underbelly, because when he stands up, you're actually still able to deal continuous damage to that part of his body throughout the entire turf war. It's also really important that you don't accidentally cause a KO or a knockdown or sleep or paralysis on Arch-Tempered Valhazak before the turf war occurs, because if Odogarin is in the same section of the map as you when you cause one of those ailments, uh, and then Valhazak of course is incapacitated, what'll happen is the turf war will never occur. You don't get that bonus damage, you don't get to attack him during the long animation, instead you're in this situation where now you're dealing with this kind of petty fight between Arch-Tempered Valhazak and Odogarin, and occasionally Odogarin will actually target you as well. Very, very bad. I mean, <laughs> you go from having this big advantage with the Turf War to now dealing with two monsters. And so you really have to pay attention to when Odogarin is about to show up. And then when he does, just make sure you don't cause any ailments on Arch-Tempered Valhazak. I know you could accidentally break one of his parts and that'll cause him to be knocked over, but just just be, be mindful of it, be wary. Advanced tip number four is just going to be a bunch of smaller tips put together because I didn't feel like they deserve their own, you know what I'm saying, like their own <laughs> listing in the list. So I tried the Bond Ball, the Route of Bond Ball, on my Palico gear, but he only managed to put Arch-Tempered Valhazak to sleep one time on his own. So I, I, I'm instead going to recommend bringing the Devil Joe ham Hammer, what is it called, the Vangus Mace? I, yeah, I recommend that instead for a little extra damage, maybe a little bit of Elder Seal as well. Then there was also torch pods. Everybody's like, be sure to bring the torch pods. Torch pods will clear uh, the effluvia in the area that you shoot them, but it seems like they won't clear it for very long or the DOT, whatever it is, the cloud comes back very quickly. I know that Valhazak himself puts down fresh effluvia pretty quickly anyways. So when someone gives you a tip about the torch pods, you can pretty much ignore that tip. It doesn't help as much as you think it does. Your next mini tip is that I really liked using Mega Barrel Bombs in this particular fight. So one thing you could do is set up your radio menu to craft a whole bunch of them or be able to craft a whole bunch of them and then just constantly use them, uh, the Mega Barrel Bombs, anytime Valhazak is running around all crazy and you don't feel like chasing. His body is so large that he tends to be in range of the explosions when they go off. Just keep in mind though that you should not be using a Mega Barrel Bomb strategy in the middle of a multiplayer fight since it knocks everyone away. And as a last tip, I want to show you a quick route for finding Valhazak at the beginning of the fight. Uh, there's multiple ways to reach him, but I believe this is the fastest route. Advanced tip number five is going to be all about the changes to Valhazak's nest for the arch-tempered version of the fight. This time he's going to stop early, see normally he would climb that big pile of bones, but this time he's going to stop early and use two attacks before going to sleep. These attacks will then cause his nest to be surrounded by acid water and make it a bit harder to get a nice wake up attack on him, just a little bit though, it's, it's totally possible to still get a strong wake up attack when he goes to sleep. One thing you want to be keeping an eye out for is during those two attacks, the animations, you can totally run up to him and just wail on him because those moves happen to take a long time, they're predictable, and they're easy to avoid. So be ready to chase him into the nest quickly for that punish before he actually finishes the moves and then goes to sleep. Uh, after he's gone to sleep, uh, be sure to get your wake-up attack just like you normally would. Just uh, f do it from the edge of uh, you know the safe, the safe environment, safe land, right? Try not to stand in the acid water too much. Uh, I don't know what to tell you. You could drink a mega potion. You could use a Astera jerky to recover the, the red health. Whatever works for you best. Just, yeah, don't miss out on that, <laughs> you know, because it's an arch-tempered fight. You want that free damage. 
All right, and now that we're done with the advanced tips, we're going to break down Arch-Tempered Valhazog's five most powerful attacks. This part of the guide is essential to playing well against Arch-Tempered Valhazog. That's because the best form of defense in Monster Hunter World is to not be hit by the attack in the first place. And these monsters are well designed so that you actually are able to avoid all of their, you know, all of their moveset, right? It's simply a matter of being conservative. Know the move and attack when you know you have an opening to attack. Don't just go in, spam, you know, and hope that he dies before you get killed because inevitably you'll, you'll die before he does, right? And then you'll have somebody claiming like, oh, well, you need to go in with a hyper tank armor setup and you need... The Valhazak super recovery skill is just not true. Simply learn his moveset, don't be hit by any of his moves, and the fight just goes much, much easier, right? So learning the top five moves, these are the really dangerous ones that really disrupt the fight and screw you up or kill you. So that's why we're going to go over them. Powerful attack number one, I'm calling it the sweeping beam. Valhazak detects that you're a bit further away, and so he decides what you really need is to be shot with the beam of effluvia that always sweeps from his right to his left. This attack is almost always a one-shot kill unless you built really tanky against it. It's also extremely easy to avoid, so anyone dying to this beam just needs to stop and have a bit more practice. The rule is always to run toward Valhazak's head when he goes to use this beam, right? He's going to he's going to give you a tell. It's going to be very obvious he's about to use it. And then once you've gotten back past his head, you can turn around and easily punish him for using the beam. In fact, after you've learned how to properly avoid this attack all of the time, it becomes the most consistent, punishable move that Valhazak uses, so you should actually love this move. Now if you're certain that you won't have time to make it behind his head when he begins charging up the move, this occurs when you're maybe really far away from him, simply sheath your weapon, turn your back to the beam, and then use an evade which should turn into a dive evade if you click the button at the right time, and you do that by letting the beam get close but don't let it touch you, and then roll at the last second, it turns into a dive evade as long as your back was turned. This is kind of risky, so you don't want to make this your regular strategy for dealing with the beam, especially since running behind his head is so much easier and it lets you attack him as well. Shield weapons for this move. Shield weapons will need the guard up skill in order to be able to block this. And since it's one of his most prominent moves, I strongly recommend not skipping the guard up skill. Powerful move number two, I'm calling it the effluvial cone. This move is kind of like the opposite of the sweeping beam, it's a close range move. Valhazak detects that you're crowding him, you're too close, so he decides it's time to rear up on his hind legs and shoot a cone of effluvia down that spreads out on the ground for high damage. It spreads out in a big cone. Now with this cone attack, at least you can typically survive it from full health. You know, if you if you make a mistake, it's gonna it's gonna knock you up into the air and take a chunk of your health. However, if you were wearing the Rocksteady Mantle, you will take three ticks of consecutive damage by the end of the full move if you didn't stop and get away from it. So it's very tempting to just stand there and tank it. Uh, and it is possible to tank it, but it's also very high risk to do this. You could end up with just a little bit of health left and being in one shot range. You never want to be in one shot range. The easiest way to deal with this effluvial cone is to sheath your weapon and run away until the cloud finishes traveling toward you. Then when it kind of disapparates or whatever the word would be, you can turn back around and start running toward him and try to get an attack in before he gets to his next move. Powerful attack number three I'm calling the body slam. Similar to effluvial cone, Valhazak decides that you're way too close to him, so he rears up on his hind legs, does a little step forward toward you, and then he slams his body down on top of you. If you happen to get hit by the body slam, you'll be knocked down for a while, right? You'll need to recover, kind of like being stunned, or you'll be dead, because this, this move actually deals a ton of damage. If you avoided the initial attack, the body slam, it's likely that you were still close enough to be affected by wind pressure, so the move also has wind pressure, unless you really, really backed up away from him before he landed on the ground. After Valhazak lands, he looks suspiciously like he's sleeping, but he's not. 
feel free to run up and attack his tail at this point, but unless you have the Temporal Mantle active, I would always avoid his head while he is still laying down. That's because what Val is really doing, he's sneakily waiting for you to attack his head so that he can charge a beam of effluvia and fire it all around his head as he gets back on his feet. I've died many times to this. I think a lot of people have died to this because it's kind of a surprise attack, right? It's like a ninja attack. Now, I've never not been hit by this beam if I was near his head when he got up. However, I can say that I can consistently attack near his hind legs and back, and, and it appears the beam just not, it just doesn't travel there. So yeah, go for the hind legs, go for the tail. Okay, so body slam. When he starts it up, get far enough away to avoid the whole thing and the wind pressure, then run in and attack near his hind legs and tail while he's trying to stand back up. Powerful move number four is gonna be Valhazok's Roar. It's not really the most powerful move in his moveset, he just uses it all the time, and it's a very consistent damage dealer. So, the arch-tempered version of his roar gets to be a bit more dangerous than the other version, right? Not only are you stunned like you normally would be for a roar, but you also take damage from his belly hitbox. His belly gets a hitbox now, if you were close enough to it. And if you weren't close enough it, uh, to his belly, if you were just out of the range of his belly, you're, you're probably still going to be affected by wind pressure. This move now gets wind pressure. And this causes you to stand there flinched or whatever, you know, you're like recovering from the wind pressure. And while you're standing there, you're just taking damage from the DOT, from the effluvia, right? This roar is extremely annoying and even dangerous. So if you have a very efficient build, like for example, this Gunlance counter build that I put together for you guys, feel free to take a very efficient build like this one and uh, bring earplugs onto it and just keep attacking him throughout the roar. I found that in general, it was actually pretty hard to build earplugs on a lot of builds because you're already giving up a number of slots to health boost, which I strongly recommend, and a fluvial resist, which that's like a must. Unless you're a speedrunner, right? You can skip both of those if you're a speedrunner and you're gonna juggle them the whole time, but if you're just playing casual, health boost, a fluvial resist, and fortitude are a must. So you've got the earplugs charm, and you can mix that with the basil coil or the basil helm, and that'll give you five levels of earplugs uh, in order to resist his roars. But, you know, it's, it's worth considering building if you can it's just kind of expensive to build it, especially because you're already building those other things that I just mentioned. And finally, wrapping things up, powerful move number five is the head and tail whip combo. Valhazak has this move where he whips his head around in one direction, but then he also follows up with another whip with this tail. He does a tail whip, which you might have unwittingly placed yourself in range of when you were trying to avoid his head. This is also one of those moves where if you aren't careful, you can take two large ticks of damage with the Rock Steady Mantle on. I actually have an example of that for you. Because you never get knocked back by the first part of the attack, which means you can just stand there and also be hit by the second part of it. And that makes that head and tail whip combo really dangerous uh, because it deals really high damage if you take both hits. So be careful with your Rock Steady Mantles. The other reason why it's dangerous, the fact that you don't get a lot of time to react to this move. It's not like his slower attacks where you can easily dodge them like 100% of the time. The head tail whip, you know, it's like a combination of things, right? They are slow, you can react to them, but they've got a lot of range, okay? So if you, you react it a little bit too slow, you're still gonna get nicked by it. Just remember that staying near Valhazak's hind legs is nearly always the safest place for a melee build, and that's because most of his moves pivot on his hind legs and the hind legs themselves do not count as a hitbox, right? They don't actually damage you. Well, unless he's running. <laughs> Be careful with that. And those are my choices for Valhazak's five deadliest moves. I think I'll give an honorable mention to his dash and jumping attacks, right? He runs around a lot, he jumps, he'll do one big leap attack. But honestly, as long as you're strafing, you can easily dodge any of those moves. So keep strafing and assume he's going to rush forward like many of the Elder Dragons do. And that is the end of the guide. If you've got a tip or an idea you'd like to share with everyone, don't forget to leave it in a comment down below. I want to thank you all for watching, and I'll see you guys next time.